And uh, let me begin by just um, telling you, in case you didn't know it, that um, Jung's, one of his major works of art, <laughs> the Red Book, uh, is now on display at a major art exhibition in Venice. It's called the Venice Biennale. And it takes place every two years in Venice. And um, this year, the curator, young Italian man, curator uh, for the Biennale, um, had an interest in Jung and uh, what uh, he's trying to um, research and, and, and think about and reflect on, the sources of art. Where does art come from? Uh, the general view is that art comes from traditions, from uh, basically our conscious world, whether collective consciousness or individual consciousness, that the artist is someone who looks around and uh, is inspired by other artists or the artistic tradition and works from that. And this curator's idea is a Jungian idea, Jung's idea, that is that art, uh, the source of art is actually not in consciousness. Uh, that the wellspring for art is in the unconscious, that there is a kind of instinct for art, if you will. And I want to say a few words about that as by way of introduction. Now, by being shown at the Biennale, Jung is being recognized as an artist. Uh, in fact, a world-class world artist uh, and a very important artist, uh, deserving the attention of people who are coming to look at art. And... I'm not sure that he would be so happy with this because he didn't want to be known as an artist. Um, he denied many times that he was an artist or that what he was making was art. Uh, he felt it was a kind of temptation off uh, away from his fundamental profession, which was a physician um, and a psychological theorist, a psychoanalyst. Yet yeah, he is again at 61 with a trumpet made of a paper in his hand. And he would actually play his music, look at his drawing, like on the desk you see in front of him. He would look at his drawing and, and read the music, he would say, out of his drawing and play it. And actually there are some people who did um, play some music on the basis of his music. And if you go on the, uh, on the website, and Google Adolf Wölfli in one word, dot ch, you'll find there a few pieces of music. Quite nice. Um, so that's one of the first pictures I want to show you about the themes. So one big theme is fall, falling, uh, the fall, uh, and punishments and catastrophes, accidents, um, sins, crucifixions, executions, rapes all of these, and also rescues, and sometimes being born again, and being helped by women. So this one, he said it was death fall of Saint An uh, Adolf. So you see, you, you would think it's a girl falling head down. For him, it was him. And a lot of times he would think of him or depict a child actually. And I think that at this time, young boys would also wear skirts. So at, at least for him, it's clear, it's him falling down. And one thing I have to tell you about German, the de German language, the fall in German has two meanings. Is for one, it's a fall, the symbol of a fall, a fall from heaven, from, fall from innocence, falling into hell, into sin, into evil. But it's also a case, like a judicial case. So. I understand both meanings when you talk about falls. That's another fall. He just said it was fall, but actually you don't see any fall. No, nobody's falling here. Or maybe this little head and in the lower part is falling, could be. But what dominates actually the picture is something wonderfully harmonious like uh, a music key or a music instrument even. The theme of the Virgin and Child of Saint Anne was popular during the Renaissance as evident in two paintings, one by Masaccio and Mazzolino and the other by Durer. So this is uh, 
Masaccio Mausolino. You see Anne in the background, Mary, baby Jesus, very different feel from the Leonardo. And this is done by Durer, again, Mary, Anne, and the baby Jesus. And of course, Durer was the leader of the Northern Renaissance, while Leonardo was kind of seen as the leader of the Southern Renaissance painting. As is well known, Freud took a special interest in the St. Anne painting at the Louvre and wrote a small book called The Childhood Reminiscence of Leonardo da Vinci, using it as a means to analyze Leonardo. He did make cultural historical leaps, but evaluated the painting in relation to what he imagined to be Leonardo's personal psychology. Freud saw in the drapery of the skirts of Anne and Mary, and I think you can, should be able to see that in the white outlining. Um, it, Freud saw in the drapery of the skirts of Anne and Mary a vulture. This observation he associated with a childhood description by Leonardo of being attacked in infancy by a vulture. He connected the bird image with the Egyptian goddess Mut, who had a vulture's head. He argued that the Renaissance Italians would have had access to Egyptian texts through Hor Apollo, and that they believed the vulture to exist only in the female sex fertilized by the wind. Further, Freud associated Mut with the German Mutter with mother. He saw Leonardo as passively homosexual, and that Mary and Anne represented the two mothers who raised him, his biological mother and his father's young wife. Freud assumed that in the painting, Leonardo was remembering these two personal mothers. In 1923, Eric McLaughlin wrote a letter to the editor called Leonardo in the Consulting Room and proclaimed that Freud's theory that the bird who inserted its tail in Leonardo's mouth was not a vulture but a kite, a very different bird, thus dispelling Freud's string of associations to Egyptian hieroglyphs, virgin births by the wind, and so forth. The confusion was caused by a mistranslation. This would seem to be an amplification gone awry. So Jung made the following comments in response to Freud's book. He says, interwoven with the apparently personal psychology, there is an interpersonal motif known to us from other fields. This is the motif of the dual mother, an archetype to be found in many variants in the field of mythology and comparative religion, and forming the basis of numerous collective representations. Jung argues that Leonardo was in all probability representing the mythological dual mother motif, by no means his own personal prehistory. Further, he asks, what about all the other artists who painted the same theme? Surely not all of them had two mothers. 